The audience you heard boos because Harry Connick Jr., who you may or may not be familiar with, he's an American jazz pianist and vocalist who has moved on to become an actor now, but in the 1990s and early 2000s was a, ma a major star. Um, Harry Connick Jr. is the person who got up and banged the gong and said, shut this down. The two Australian judges, one of them gives them a very high score, says they're very cute. Uh, the other Australian judge gives them a very low score, and then Harry Connick Jr. gives them a zero. And then later in the episode, and I would encourage you if you have the time and interest to watch the whole thing, it's rather interesting. At the very end, Harry Connick Jr. gets up there and says, if you did that in the United States, essentially you wouldn't get off the stage. That in the United States, those images are so offensive that they're not, we don't allow them to be publicly performed anymore. And you can tell the Australian host is mortified. But what's in interesting here is in Australia in 2009, somebody had to tell the Australian audience that this was not appropriate cultural behavior anymore. So my point is, that is blackface minstrelsy, a form of cultural performance that emerged in the United States before 1820, but really consolidated during the 1820s and afterwards, and has spread around the world. So it's being performed in Australia in 2009, and I'll give you other examples of that in a moment. So the point that I want to make today, what I'd like us to do is to explore why this tradition emerged when it did, and why it has endured so long and proved such a rich, and I don't mean that in a positive way, I mean that just in a fertile source of inspiration for American popular music. So that's the agenda for today. Now, to start off with, before there was minstrelsy, blackface minstrelsy is of something I'll explain in a moment, before there was black face minstrelsy, Americans, of course, made music and listened to music. They listened and made, or I should say they performed opera. They performed what we would now call classical music. They performed the folk musics, if you will, the contemporary music of the lands they came from. They performed religious music. So they had a wide array of music. But from the perspective of non-Americans, that is people who were not living in what we now call the United States, from the, in the eyes of Europeans, for example, American music was bad. It was badly performed in not very good spaces. And so, to the extent that there was anything new in American music, it was believed to be new music that was brought to the United States by new immigrants, by new musicians coming in to port cities and introducing new music to the United States. So if you had asked a Londoner or a Parisian in 1810, what is American music? They, wouldn't, they could not have answered that. They would have thought that was a crazy question. There is no such thing. By 1840, from Australia to Paris to London, people knew blackface minstrelsy. And if you'd said, what is American music? They'd say, there, that's American music. So without, I, I, strongly believe, and without exaggerate, making an exaggerated claim, American popular music as a meaningful category for us to pay attention to begins with blackface minstrelsy. So that's why we're going back two centuries. Now, on Monday, 
we're going to have time, and I really, I would ask you all who are present here to save up your questions, because I have to race through a topic that I could go on days, and you probably don't want me to go on days about this. But save your questions for Monday, and then the rest of the class can be here on Monday too, and I'll ask them to keep questions. So I really want to engage this, and the question that I throw out there for you to think about is what is going on in blackface minstrelsy? The first thing you're going to say is, well, obviously it's racist. This is white people aping, mimicking, distorting African-American music, culture, physical being. So, Blackface minstrelsy is an expression of white loathing of people of color. And not only did blackface minstrelsy express racism, it generated it. So there were white Americans who were never going to read a treatise on the hierarchy of races, were never going to read a treatise on the alleged deficiencies, physiological deficiencies of Africans and African Americans or people of color. But they went to minstrel shows and there they saw sort of embodied in a per performance tradition ideas that bolstered crude notions of white supremacy. But one of the things I want to point out today is blackface minstrelsy wasn't just, wasn't such an enduring tradition just because it expressed raw white hostility towards African Americans. It did that. I'm, there's no way I want to deny that or mitigate that. But it also expressed envy, <coughs> fascination with African Americans and African American culture. And I ask you to reflect on these, these are all doctors from Sydney. So these are highly educated medical doctors from Sydney performing in this <coughs> talentless skit, in my view. Why? Why are they doing this? Because part of the pleasure of doing that is they're doing something they would never do if they weren't in blackface. So there's an opportunity that for them to act in ways that they normally wouldn't through this vehicle, this cultural vehicle, if you will. So I want to emphasize this and explore this at some length today because I think this explains, as I've said, the power, the tenacity, the endurance of this performance tradition, and why it has insinuated its way into so much of American popular culture, not only in the 19th century, but in the 20th century. All right, so let me go back and just observe a few things about this tradition. The earliest mentions of anything that sounds like or seems like blackface minstrelsy are in the 18 teens, so between 1810 and 1820 roughly, in New York City. By the early 1820s, there are enough re references to, be, to make it clear that this was moving from just kind of an eccentric, idiosyncratic, one-off type of performance to something that was becoming, shall we say, commonplace. The pioneers of it were working class performers in the working class districts of New York City. What are now, you know, lower, very low Manhattan. Um, and most of the significant innovators of this performance tradition were Irish immigrants. So we're going to have to try to figure out why this group at this time would be pioneering this form of cultural performance. Now, the popularizer, the first real popularizer of minstrelsy was 
a performer by the name of Thomas Daddy Rice. And there he is in his blackface garb with a song that he popularized, Jim Crow. Now the story that T. Daddy Rice told, and keep in mind, it's interesting, you know, he used the name Daddy Rice that speaks to a kind of tradition of performers adopting a kind of evocative stage name. Well, T. Daddy Rice, um, allegedly, he was a performer in uh, theatrical, you know, he was an actor in the kind of variety shows that were popular for working class audiences at this period of time. And allegedly in Cincinnati, he saw a crippled and, uh, well, a crippled black former slave who inspired him to dress up in rags, adopt dialect that he associated with the speech of this former slave, and to develop a dance and song that he thought captured the essence of this former slave that he had seen. So the point being here is when T. Daddy Rice created his character, he didn't choose to, if you will, mimic or represent or channel a black man in full health, in full command of his circumstances. Instead, he took as marginalized a person as you could imagine and adopted that persona as his character. My point about T. Daddy Rice is he's not the originator, even though he got acclaim as the originator, as the original Ethiopian delineator, as they were sometimes called. But he was the popularizer. And by the early 1830s, T. Daddy Rice was a familiar name to people who attended public performances in New York City and a few other cities that T. Daddy Rice visited. So by the 1830s, not only was T. Daddy Rice well known, but his character of Jim Crow was becoming quite familiar to Americans. But this still leaves the question, okay, so here we have one of these artistic <coughs> innovators, in air quotes. So we can see how T. Daddy Rice started to take a tradition that had already emerged and he popularized it, but why was anybody interested in seeing a white Irish American perform as a crippled black man in dialect, in blackface, in rags, et cetera, et cetera? What was the appeal of this? Why would a white man choose to appropriate, if you will, the visible appearance of the most oppressed group in the United States. Well, there are several answers to that. You'll learn from the essay that you'll read next week by Stephanie Dunson that minstrelsy and the images of minstrel performers that accompanied sheet music We'll also talk about sheet music next week. The images are incredibly demeaning, incredibly hostile, viciously racist. So without question, as I noted before, this is an expression of white contempt that demeaned African Americans in almost every conceivable way. So we have the Jim Crow character. Here's another song. Here we have a happy slave dancing on a tree trunk, playing an instrument, and what would appear to be hundreds of slaves in the background dancing. So 
Here's an image of people who are in this horrifically oppressed condition of slavery, of course, and yet they couldn't seem to be having more fun possibly, right? These must be the happiest people on the face of the planet. So it's dehumanizing in the sense that it ignores the reality of African American existence and instead presents this image of people who can sing and dance at the drop of a coin. There are also other images that we could unpack this at length. Uh, there's the character at the top, of course, who looks totally dissipated and just sitting there. But we have here the character with the fox and the black man running beside it. That's always a symbol for blacks stealing chickens, blacks and thievery, blacks being, uh, you can't, untrustworthy, prone to criminality. There are all sorts of signifiers there. So the Jim Crow character is, of course, the incredibly blessed slave who is living a joyful existence on southern plantations. There's a close-up. Then there's the Zip Coon character. This was another character that had emerged by the 19, 1830s and was a stock character in minstrelsy. And I will tell you, you can see legacies of this in comedy well into the 20th century. Who was Zip Coon? Zip Coon was the African American who left the plantation and went where he shouldn't and aspired to be what he shouldn't. In other words, he's the African American dandy who dresses way above his station and tries to talk way above his abilities. Here are the lyrics for old Zip Coon. You can see it's written in dialect. So you could never confuse the subject of this song as anything but an African-American. And you can see he talks in utter gibberish. Well, it's, it's actually you can understand it, but he can't speak appropriately. And uh, there are many, many lyrics, but the, uh, I think, I'm not sure I included, uh, I didn't include this one. Um, I don't think I include the lyrics where he talks about how he's going to be president one day. And in 1830, the idea that an African American could be president of the United States was like saying there will be a time when we will all live on Pluto. It's just, it was beyond the conception of anybody in the white audience. So this was a picture of the strutting, absurd African American. So making a mockery of any African-American pretenses. So these are images of African-Americans, Zip Coon and Jim Crow, that meshed easily with the most virulent, highbrow, educated, scientific explanations of black inferiority. They're also in minstrelsy evidence of white fears about blacks. There are depictions of African Americans as being very mercurial, moody, one minute passive, the next minute violent, unpredictable. Which of course makes sense in a nation where African Americans are enslaved because you know, there's always the possibility that the enslaved will no longer accept particular abuse or generalized abuse, so there, there's reason why many Americans would be concerned about the mood, if you will, of African Americans. But there's a deeper point, which is the minstrel, minstrel show depicted African Americans as being simultaneously simple, simple-minded, but also inscrutable. You could never know exactly what these characters were going to do or think. So there we see fear, loathing fear. But then there's also curiosity. And we can see hints of this at the same time and even in these same images. So here's Jim Crow, a variation of that T. Daddy Rice image we saw replicated, people were just like sampling today. People were, if you will, visually sampling all the time in sheet music. So we have Jim Crow here looking ludicrous. Remember, there's our Zip Coon character replicated here as well. 
But there are also some other images that this black man, I, I know he has the waist the size of a pencil, but that was just as women were supposed to have these tiny waists that was considered masculine to have you know, that hourglass figure. So that's a, that's a hunk of a man right there. That's a surprising image of an African-American man, right? And then we have African-Americans up here. It looks slightly caricatured, but we have African-Americans in military uniform marching in some sort of civic parade. Now here we have an image of two African-American men fighting over a woman. Fighting over women is a you know, time-honored thing to sing about. Um, but they're not depicted in gross, grotesque caricatures like Jim Crow. Here we have a black man out there with his banjo and the possum. That looks like a kind of chicken thief image going to me. But then we have the black man up at the top who looks like he's a poor man, but it's, it's not, again, not depicted as a grotesque caricature. So the point being here is this is a song that seems to have a much more complex, more expansive representation of African Americans. Not positive necessarily, but suggesting a kind of curiosity about the capacities of African Americans. And for literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of white Americans who had no daily contact with African Americans, minstrelsy was going to be the way in which they learned about this exotic population. And then, of course, there's the envy that I alluded to with regards to the Australian performers, perhaps. So when whites blackened up their faces, adopted black dialect, imitated black ways of talking, moving, dancing, singing, laughing, and performing, they were engaging in a fantasy of kind of uninhibited pleasure that contemporary attitudes about behavior didn't allow respectable white people. You blackened up your face, you could do things, say things, that otherwise were out of bounds. And so blackface minstrel performers could talk about some things, not just about African Americans, and I want to emphasize, of course they were doing that. But they could all talk about contemporary politics. They could talk about class in America. They could talk about women. They could talk about the things that interested generally young men in ways that they otherwise probably wouldn't have or couldn't have. So in a way, you think of you know, the old medieval cliche of how you know, some nobleman or a king has the fool, the court fool, who comes out and says things that everybody thinks but nobody will say to the king. Well, minstrelsy allowed working class white performers and audiences some of that same uninhibited expression. So it's a very complex tradition with a lot of motivations that may explain its appeal. Now I've been talking about it here almost entirely in kind of social cultural context. Now I want to talk a little bit about the performance tradition. One of the other reasons it endures so long is it's incredibly flexible. You could adapt it. If you want to think of it this way, it's sort of like a set of Lego blocks that you can reorganize in various ways to make different things. You're always using the exact same blocks, but nevertheless, you can shift them about. So here we have grotesque, truly, extreme, I know these are blown up so large, but truly grotesque caricatures of African Americans. That's not what I want to focus on. 
instead I want to focus on the instruments that you see these caricatures performing on. These are the four core instruments of minstrelsy. Can any of you, can any of you see that one back there, what that instrument is? Tambourine. This one? <laughs> Fiddle. Violin. Can you make out what that is? That's a banjo. Probably can't make out what that is, right? Triangle. What else? Bones. Absolutely. So, but it's, I mean, it's, a triangle is arguably melodic percussion instrument. Uh, but it's a, those who suggested triangle, it's the same idea. It's a percussion instrument. So, a few things to quickly note about this. The bones. The bones are literally a mechanical counterpart, if you will. Well, mechanical is the wrong word for it. They're, it's just a, an analog to the castanets. They actually could use animal bones, or you could use pieces of wood. It's a way of making, using your fingers to make percussion. And you can actually make pretty complex percussion patterns. So we have a percussion instrument at this end. Tambourine. As you can see, that's a big tambourine. We're not talking about the, I mean, does anybody use a tambourine anymore? Can you think of any artist who routinely plays a tambourine? But you go back to the 60s, and, and you know, in the 60s, there would be uh, s male singers would sometimes, I think of the monkeys, for example, uh, shake the tambourine. In any case, we think of the tambourine as being, well, like I'm sort of suggesting, what's the point? But in this era, the tambourine was a big percussion instrument with a comparatively loose skin, so it was a kind of uh, thudding sound. And what's important is the thud, if you will, the percussion on the skin as opposed to shaking it to, to rattle it. So this is an era before people had drum kits. We'll talk about them eventually. So this was essentially, if you want to think of it this way, if you are a drummer or think about drums, this is like somebody with cymbals or a hi-hat. And this is like somebody who's got a bass drum. So it, simple point, we got two percussion instruments. These are instruments that, uh, you know, they're, they're not peculiar to minstrelsy. So, and they don't have any particular repertoire regardless of minstrelsy. Fiddle, violin. There were, of course, there was a rich European violin repertoire. There were great violinists in Europe in this era. There were people writing complex, virtuosic, virtu virtuoso, um, symphonic orchestral music for the violin. That's not what minstrelsy borrows from, although it had hints of it. Minstrelsy borrowed from, or appropriated, incorporated, the Anglo-Celtic tradition of fiddling. So it's highly percussive fiddling. It it's, can be melodic, but as much as anything, the fiddler is sawing out, if you will, in time, very literally, not syncopating, not doing anything terribly creative, usually, with the rhythm, so that the violin is a melodic, but also a rhythmic instrument. Then we have the banjo. The banjo is, of course, another percussion instrument. So the minstrel group had three percussive instruments. We tend to think of the modern banjo as being a melodic instrument. It's percussive because, of course, you pick the strings. You attack the strings, so to speak. Um, uh, we tend to think of it as a melodic instrument because how it has evolved. But as it was played in minstrelsy, it was partially melodic, but it's much more resembles a bass, as we think of a modern bass. It was a gourd with uh, a much um, deeper sound uh, than the contemporary steel stringed banjo that you're familiar with. Now, the banjo is the one instrument here that has unambiguous 
African origins and was unambiguously incorporated into this tradition from outside of any European Anglo-Celtic tradition. <coughs> prior to the turn of the 19th century, so prior to roughly the time that minstrelsy emerged, we don't know of any whites playing the banjo. It was an instrument adapted by Africans in the United States and part of their performance traditions, not part of broader white popular culture. But as a result of minstrelsy, it would migrate into American popular and become the American instrument. Synonymous with American music for the remainder of the 19th and well into the 20th century. So the thing that I want to emphasize about this music is when we think about its appeal, there are a couple points to keep in mind. This is foot stomping music. Now when you hear it, I'm going to play it in a moment, you may think to yourself, oh, I wouldn't foot stomp to this. But for its time, this was foot stomping music, highly rhythmic. You can't help but hear the stomp in this. And so to exemplify that, we're going to listen to old Dan Tucker, one of the most famous popular minstrel songs to emerge, as you can see. In 1843 it was written. There are hundreds of covers of this song. And if you want to, you can go to YouTube and watch Bruce, Sting, Bruce Springsteen perform this in many live performances. He's covered it as well. Pete Seeger, I mean, as I say, there are hundreds of recorded performances of this. I'm going to play an example that was recorded by a group that tries to replicate the sound of what we think 19th century minstrelsy would have sounded like. Because, of course, we have no recordings from this period of time. So they are playing this on instruments just like you just heard. I put the lyrics up there because that gives you some idea of the lyrical content. And you might also notice something interesting about this song, if I can... <coughs> trust you heard the chorus. It's verbatim, get out of the way, melodically, lyrically. And the song, Old Dan Tucker, is about a guy going to town and he's going to tear the place up. He's drunk, he wants to fight, he wants to mess around with people and get out of the way. I have no idea if Ludacris has ever heard Old Dan Tucker, but I have no doubt producers, I mean Old Dan Tucker is one of the most famous American folk songs of all time. I have no doubt that that is not coincidence that Get Out of the Way is the chorus for both songs about very similar things. I may be stretching it, but I don't believe I am. In any case, um, old Dan Tucker gives you a sense of the instrumentation there. You heard the plucked banjo, which as I say is plucked in a way that's more like a bass than what you think of a contemporary banjo. You heard the, the castanet-like sound of the, the bones. Um, you heard the t thump of the tambourine, and I think you could hear how rhythmically propulsive that music was. <laughs> 
This is foot stomping music, as I said, which is what you would imagine young men out on the town in the Bowery in New York City wanting to get drunk on a Friday night, a Saturday night in 1832 would want to listen to. So, this was a performance tradition. Those four instruments were the, were the centerpiece of minstrelsy throughout its history. There's a point that I would like to make about them. With the exception of the violin, none of these instruments are instruments you could master by going to conservatory. Right? If you go to a conservatory in 1830 and say, I want to learn how to play the banjo, there's going to be nobody there. Not that there were many conservatories in the United States to begin with. But there's going to be nobody there qualified to teach you. These were vernacular instruments and vernacular performance styles that were learned by mimicking copying, learning from other artists. So this severs that kind of connection between American, it doesn't, severs is too strong a word. It mitigates the connection between innovation in American popular music and new sounds coming in from overseas. This instead was a sound that was being generated internally to the United States on the basis of musical vocabularies that were being hashed out in the United States. Even while the fiddlers may be borrowing from Anglo-Celtic traditions, nevertheless, the particular instrumentation and the musical vocabulary that they start to f started to compile in the 1830s would be fleshed out by American vernacular performers. So, this tradition was associated with working class culture through the 1830s and especially Irish American immigrant culture during the 1830s. But during the 1840s it began to be domesticated, if you will. It began to be popularized as middle class entertainment. And I'll explain